The following is an Ice on Mars presentation. Hey everybody, tired of shoving ice picks under your own fingernails and got a couple hours to kill? Let's talk about Hall Pass. What the fuck? Um. Hey everyone, this is Michael T. Bradley. And J. Wilford Neville. And we are here today to talk about the movie Hall Pass, which is a Farrelly Brothers movie. I, I guess that kind of seemed like maybe uh, uh, too big of a fish in a barrel, but when we chose this, we did not realize it was a Farrelly Brothers movie. <laughs> the main reason that we chose it is because we thought it would be interesting to talk about a kind of mainstream movie that at least plays around with the concept of polyamory and talk about that, but this movie is so not even on that... I mean, I don't know. There, there are a few things to talk about uh, along that vein, but that's... Uh, uh, but it, it was it was definitely not what I was expecting, that's for sure. Yeah. It was instead a heartwarming medical tale of rickets in the time of... No, it's it's <laughs> just a horrible, horrible Farrelly Brothers movie. Do you want to give us a basic plot synopsis, Wilford? Sure. So basically it goes like this. Uh, Owen Wilson and Jason Sudeikis are dissatisfied with their sex lives in their long-term marriages of about 20 years or so. It comes to a head in both circumstances with their wives, sort of, in the case of Jason Sudeikis, because he gets caught masturbating in his minivan and strangely doesn't get a ticket. And their wives decide, after talking to their friend who's a psychologist conveniently, that the way they fix this is by giving them a hall pass. The reasoning being that if they go out and actually can do this, if they can actually go out and sleep with other women, then they'll just crash and burn. And then they'll realize that they can't do any better than their wives, <laughs> and they'll come crawling back. <laughs> Either they will fail miserably, or they will get it out of their system, I guess. Right. And their wives, of course, are played by Jenna Fisher and Christina Applegate. Christina Applegate looks so different now. Than what? Than married with children. Well, that was like 25 years ago. <laughs> Let's go through our what-the-fuck moments. Uh, Wilford, if you want to start us out there. Of course, the assertion that women all have one dream, and that's to have a house and to have a nice oven and to have babies. That's all they want. Here's a sampling of the different things that we get to see pretty much live on screen. Shitting, jerking off, black and Irish full frontal, uh, playing up every kind of uh, stereotype that you can there, and... A diarrhea sneeze. I don't see why that's such a big deal. I get to see one of those practically every day. The line, oh. you think your shit don't float? I wouldn't titty bang any of you in a snowstorm. <laughs> Which, much like Family Guy, some of the lines from here are pretty funny out of context. But then if you watch the actual film, I don't, I like what, ha it's like a meta wince. Like, every part of my body was wincing so much already that then it winced again, and it, uh, it I sprained the arch of my foot, curling my toes in embarrassment about the fact that I was watching this movie. <laughs> I got a lot of good toe curl reps in. Owen Wilson has a personals ad that he puts up, and his quote on it is, If you were a fish, every day would be Good Friday. The line, You're awesome at sex, followed by a high five. Uh, we have fun here, don't we? So, yeah, this, um, this movie, I don't know where to start with this movie. Well, maybe one of the first things that we could talk about would be the phenomenon that is starting to reach trope status, it seems, of in something that is or borders on the sex romp, that the protagonist's best friend is always douchey and misogynistic and pathetic. Definitely. I, I mean, it is Sudeikis you're talking about, right? That yeah. he's, Yeah, because he is, it, it's like Owen Wilson and Jenna Fisher are kind of this relatable, romantic couple who happen to be going through a bit of the doldrums, whereas Jason Sudeikis and Christina Applegate seem on the verge of murdering each other at times. Right. Their, their relationship is totally dysfunctional. Though they, I, I don't know, I, I guess I find them more fun to watch in a lot of ways. Mostly because I like Christina Applegate. I don't know, right? But, <laughs> but I think that's common, right? I mean, it's like in uh, Summer Catch, we have Matthew Lillard, who's not 
Yeah, not quite as bad as in, like, Good Luck Chuck, for instance. It really ties into the fact that they, for whatever reason, you know, I think it's like when you do these crazy sex romp comedies to make at least one character kind of relatable and make sure that the, I guess, they see it as that the women in the audience have someone who they can relate to and they don't just hate everybody. You have to kind of um, co- contrast with everyone around him so that everyone around him is way, way worse, right? That's I, I think that's the point. Uh, that's the reason that we get this kind of trope. That's the function of the protagonist always having shitty friends is just to make the protagonist likable to us. Right. He's just kind of along for the ride or whatever. If he weren't kind of surrounded by this sort of thing. Because I, cause here's the part where the movie really broke down for me. Well, I mean, okay. I mean, it's not meant to be taken seriously or whatever. But the part where I was like, no, that just doesn't work. Is at the end when A, Owen Wilson gives this like heartbreaking speech about... Because he finally, he's like able to do it. He's like actually able to get to this point where he's going to have sex with this beautiful woman who's really fun and attractive and intelligent and interesting and da-da-da-da-da. And really needs some sunscreen. And she touches his chest and he gives this little speech about how, you know, the first time that I had sex with the woman I married, she fell asleep there and there was this little bit of drool and the first time that I held my first child was right on that spot and I just can't go through with this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it was like, that's really heartwarming, but like, I, this is this complete 180, I felt, from the character that he had been all along. And then the part that really got me is after that, he goes and sees his wife, and he's like, because she talks about how he can't even remember the first time that, or he can't even remember when he lost his virginity. And right. she remembers it to the hour, and he's like, the time that I lost it, and he gives a date, and she's like, that's when we were dating. And he's like, yeah, you were the first and the only. And I was like, what? <laughs> you know, like, to me, that just did not track at all. Until that moment when Owen Wilson actually realizes that he can actually have, apparently, a one-night stand with this Australian girl, Lee, changes his mind and decides that that's not what he wants. Like, up until then, the whole point is that just that it's not as easy as you remember it being, going out and picking up chicks. Right. And it really should have been... How is it that Owen Wilson was even confused about that? Because he never picked up another chick. Yeah, yeah. Like, he's still sleeping with the only girl who ever gave him any. Exactly. why is he fantasizing about his halcyon days that never actually even existed? You know, there's that scene where they're at the park, like, playing frisbee or whatever. That was good luck, Chuck. Or whatever they're doing. And the girls are all (laughs) hanging out there, and they're talking about, yeah, man, you know, back in the day, we were so hardcore, and picking up chicks all the time and they make it sound as if like they had these sex capades back in college and it's like well apparently Owen Wilson never had that except with Jenna Fisher so I mean it just feels like why does he even want this hall pass it feels as if he's this guy who is so deeply in love and so committed to his life why what was it at the point that it was you know why is he so sex obsessed and talking with his best friend about getting chicks all the time I mean was this just completely and totally him trying to look cool to Jason Sudeikis you know I mean it it felt as if suddenly he was a different character well it kind of felt to me as though like that was supposed to be her whole scheme working right that was supposed to be the hall pass having done what it was supposed to which was for him to realize that once he's actually there and in the situation where he might have sex with someone else to realize that actually this isn't really something that I want sure but you could do that and he still could have had sex with other women in before they got together you know what I mean Yeah, I'm not sure what the point of that particular detail was, other than to reveal the fact that they have really, really poor communication and absolutely no vulnerability to each other in their relationship. How could she possibly not know that she's the only person he's ever had sex with? Do they not tell each other anything? I mean, that part was shocking on, like, every level, because it was just like, it it felt to me like it was in there to be romantic, Mm-hmm. But it was like, holy shit, like, I, yeah, do you guys not talk? And do you, like, I, I, I mean, I guess it just seems to me like if he was, what, 20 or something, and they had sex for the first time, and he was so, like, 
in love with her immediately, then why would he be looking at other women later? I don't know. I mean, I mean, they have, you know, maybe it's just because I'm not married and I've never been and I don't understand that whole thing and I don't ever really want to be and blah, 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 blah. But it's like, you know, hey, you really enjoy your sex life and want to have like a vibrant, exciting sex life with your partner forever. Don't have three kids. Right. Or any kids. That would be a much better like message for this movie. Use a fucking condom. If you want your life to be good, <laughs> use a goddamn condom. No it's not kidding. that complicated. That that was another frustration of mine in this movie is that it's like, okay, if, you know, a large part of why they're having this kind of unfulfilling sex life, that seems to be the kind of thing, the, the prime mover, if you will, for every problem that they have in their relationship. If that's the case, I feel it's really unbelievable that essentially the kids just disappear 10 minutes into the film. Right. You know, they, they, they go up to like... Uh, her parents' house, and then we just never see them again. And it's like, if the, if it's so difficult to find any time alone, yet apparently your parents will just watch them for a week, no questions asked, like, just do that, you know? Right. And, and, and reconnect, have some date nights, right? It's a little bit ridiculous. There are a lot of things going on there. And, I, like, for instance, one of the things that I thought really on in the movie was sort of this blithe and irresponsible reinforcement of the idea that when relationships start to flounder sexually, that it's because the wives clam up. But yeah. research actually indicates that the vast majority of the time, 70 plus percent of the time, when the relationship is essentially sexless, it's because the husband. Forgive my heterosexual assumption here, but yeah. it's not the women that clam up. It's the husbands that stop desiring their wives the majority of the time. So to sort of portray it as that case of like the women stop wanting sex, which is not usually the case, especially once they're in their like late 30s and early 40s. Men are way past their prime at that point and women are just hitting their stride sexually. That actually has been shown, not the whole of what you're saying, but that whole late 30s, early 40s for women hitting their stride sexually. That has actually been debunked in fairly recent years. Uh, apparently it was just that when that research started to be done younger women were much uh, more reticent about revealing uh, their sexuality. It, it, mm. it, uh, women just kind of hit their stride and keep on going. Well, my research seems to indicate... Uh, <laughs> of course, my research mostly involves your mom. <laughs> you know, I I wonder what she does at home alone all day. But yeah, I, I did think that was a little odd that they portrayed it as purely like her just being like, oh, for God's sake, I just want to get some rest rather than him not being attracted to her. You know, I mean, they show I, I, he basically comes across as a saint in a lot of ways because like he right. gets propositioned by the babysitter. And this is like like every frustrated father's dream. Right. And he's just like, no, thanks, ma'am. <laughs> Rides his white horse off into the sunset. <laughs> <laughs> tips his fedora actually it's a trilby like many of the movies we talk about where something falls down because of an inherent trait it, it wants to have its cake and eat it too it wants to have owen wilson be this super sexed character who misses his glory days but he never had any glory days so the you know that whole character beat at the end just doesn't work um right. I, I mean it's like him telling her uh, about his first time should have been him saying something and you know and it's like when he was 11 and he's like look i didn't want to tell you about it because it was weird uh i've always been a little creeped out by sex since you know or something i mean something like that something that isn't just like you're my only one and i never wanted anybody else and so really the first half of this film for my character made no sense yeah yeah <laughs> the thing that I thought was interesting is the fact that the wives give their husband a hall pass. Then, kind of, sort of, both of the wives take advantage of the hall pass as well, but it's never brought up between them. Right, they didn't actually negotiate that part of it. It's it's just that you guys go off and get laid if you want to. It's not a let's both take a week off from uh, from our from being married. It's that... You guys take a week off. And I actually thought that the movie was going to go to the spot where both of the wives would end up having sex. I mean, and, and, and there's obviously that red herring there, right? Bruce Thomas, uh, who I really like, is the red herring for Jenna Fisher. And I was like, that's awesome that the dad from Kyle XY is like 
got his moves on Jenna Fisher here. But I did think that was kind of strange. It seemed as if both sides of the coin were really just feeling unappreciated. And, you know, maybe in that respect, something like a hall pass is a decent idea. Of course, like, uh, I don't believe in monogamy, so (laughs) I'm maybe not the most impartial person to discuss the topic of whether or not unquestioned monogamy is a good idea in a relationship. In general, I don't think basing your relationship on an unexamined model is a good idea. You know, I don't necessarily think that everyone should not be monogamous because I'm sure not everyone is capable of it. But yeah, when you just use a particular model and you don't examine it and decide whether or not that works for you, and you don't actually negotiate the terms of your relationship, which largely seems to have been what's gone on here. Like they've just assumed certain normative things about their relationships and followed down that path. And sure, you can just operate on the assumptions for a long time, but eventually you come to a place like these guys all seem to be at. It, it seems like you could have done almost exactly the same things comedy beats wise with the movie. And I'm using that term loosely here. But, um, you know, you, you still could have had almost all the same beats. But I think it might have been more interesting to say that instead of this hall pass idea, it's that uh, they both decide let's explore o- an open relationship. Right. You could have had like them going to a key party that goes disastrously disgusting right you could have still had many 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 of the same beats and and had it be at the end of the day this mainstream monago heteronormative sort of tale where everything gets put the genie gets put back in the bottle and everybody's safe in their monogamous marriage at the end of the day but it wouldn't have made me kind of hate the characters and feel like we were perpetuating gender stereotypes so much you know right let's talk about i'm curious uh what what did you like about the movie i had about three jokes that I liked. I, I figure let's let's kind of take a moment and, and explore that. <laughs> explore the good things. I'm trying to think of what there was that made me laugh, because there was something that made me laugh. I'll give you mine. Uh, the Darth Vader uh, noises for his sleep apnea mask. I thought mm-hmm. that was amusing. I mean, it's kind of obvious, but it, it just, I thought it worked well. Stephen Merchant's little post-credits thing, I thought was very amusing. <laughs> his little... Like, fantasy scenario? Yes. And the fact that with Stephen Merchant, they were like, oh shit, we don't want people to think this movie's racist. <laughs> and so they throw in that he not only has a black wife, but in his fantasies, he's he's with an Asian chick. And so it's like, they're just like, hey, misogyny's cool. Okay, bye. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll admit, I actually, I think I did actually laugh out loud at the last line in the movie because it is so, it's so like, God, we hate Kathy Griffin. <laughs> <laughs> I, I won't spoil it in case anybody uh, decides they want to watch the movie, but the the last line right before the credits, and then I mean, technically, it just keeps going because I was so I was so confused because the credits start and I'm like, there's 11 minutes left on this movie. Jesus, <laughs> are there? Is it going to be like you know Owen Wilson completely CGI'd in this movie? Here are the eight pages of who created him. I did, of course, like Christina Applegate. Uh, yeah, I, I love Christina Applegate. There were some funny little attentions to detail that I did notice and that either impressed me that they were that attentive to detail or made me laugh. On the first night of their hall pass, of course, they go to the bangingest place they can think of to pick up chicks. That is Applebee's. Mm -hmm. Like then it's smash cut an hour later or something and they've all just eaten and drunk a bunch of wine and stuff. And all the characters' mouths are stained purple from the wine. I, 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 don't know. I, yeah, I did not. I noticed they were stained, but I just assumed it was like barbecue sauce or whatever. No, it was the red wine. It was a good attention to detail. Mm. Um, the other thing was that they have this friend that they look up to, right? The womanizer yeah. and the player who gets all the poon, right? Coakley, yeah. Coakley. And he's, uh, he's, what would you say, in his mid 50s, something like that? Uh, also sure. really so- needs some sunscreen. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. And um, he's just sort of the stereotype of that perennially single guy who is only concerned about sex and not concerned about developing relationships. And we're sort of slowly treated to what he's really like. Um, yeah. And sort of that reveal of his character, I thought, was a fairly good little bit of filmmaking. I think that the audience turns on Coakley when they're in the club. Enter the dragon. I'd like to enter her dragon. Right. Wait. That sounds uncomfortable. (laughs) 
Coakley at that moment in in one of the like in the club, he takes off his hat and you notice that he has a tan line from his hat. I did not notice that. He has a huge tan line across his forehead from where he is always wearing his fedora. Hmm. And you actually realize that he's just an asshole. <laughs> that was sort of the moment for me that it, that it became evident that Coakley was a total asshole. And then there was a funny moment later when we saw a picture of him on the beach and his face and neck and forearms are super tan and his chest is white as a ghost. <laughs> I just, I, all the pictures kind of looked obviously photoshopped to me, so I, 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 I just didn't. <laughs> but, but definitely, you know, it's like my what the fuck moment about the, the line on the personal profile. There were definitely a lot of really good pieces of detail in this movie that, you know, it, but the weird thing is that like every joke gets telegraphed to the point where like i you know you might as well have just like hooked something into your face uh, and had that little signal come down it's like you know oh let's just have a couple of beers that'll help us get loosened up and it's like we're gonna cut to them being yeah exactly one of them being uproariously drunk and the other being asleep and that's exactly what we do you know right i could have signaled that smash cut with a clap because I knew exactly when that was going to happen. To me, it felt like every joke was like that. It was like, oh, you know, Owen Wilson falling asleep in the... Um, it, it was just, it was always like, oh, hey, we're going to set up this thing that could be cool. And, oh, the fucking, um, uh, the Korean massage place, you know, the whole... It's like every joke was just like, oh, how is it going to turn horrible here? Because they can't figure out simple fucking thing. That was one thing that definitely annoyed me about this movie is that basically every plot point throughout the movie relied on every character being an idiot i really dislike that the idiot ball who's carrying the idiot <laughs> ball in this scene yeah you know trey parker once said that so many comedies are based around a really obnoxious crazy character or a, an unbelievable main character being put into normal situations and he said that that's not what they find funny what they find funny is when a normal likable relatable person is put into crazy situations and mm -hmm. i have to say in general i i think i agree with that sudeikis and wilson are just so like they, they lack so much self-awareness that you know they just make me want to punch them at all times and that makes it difficult to watch Whereas, like, the Australian girl who he's interested in, she actually seems, like, interesting and on top of the ball. And, like, I thought it was so, like, funny that, you know, because she's, she's explaining why there's this crazy guy following her around. And she's like, oh, you know, I, I messed around with him one night and I shouldn't have. And now he's kind of obsessed. And Owen Wilson's like, how far did this messing around go? And she's like, anal. And... Because of the way the movie is set up, I was just like, oh, God, another, like, doop, doop, boop joke. And then she's like, I'm joking. And I was like, oh, whoa, she's actually charming. Right. Like, th that wasn't just the movie being like, here's another taboo line that we could cross. And it's funny because, ha, 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 oh, look, somebody's chewing with their mouth open. Yeah, she was a pretty enjoyable character. I actually liked her a lot. And, and then, like, for instance... Owen Wilson's vulnerability with her, like you were saying, like he's apparently not vulnerable at all with his wife, yet with her he does that horribly lame line to kind of put the idea into her head that they could sleep together. And I was like, this, I actually really kind of liked that moment because it was so vulnerable. It seemed right. like there were so many moments that if they were expounded upon here, they could have been, this could have been a, a really interesting film. And and funny, you know, but the humor is like drunk people, stereotypes, pot brownies. I mean, it's just it's it's like going along a fucking college kids checklist or something. Well, and the thing is, like, I know a fair number of people who partake of a significant amount of the chronic from time to time. That's what the kids are calling it still, right? <laughs> yes. And to my knowledge, none of them has ever shat on a golf course. <laughs> as a consequence. But while we're talking about Lee, uh, the actress's name is Nikki Whelan, in case anyone is interested. So she's supposed to be 20 or something like that. And of course, all of our protagonists are in their 40s. And this is presented as a problem because, of course, Jason Sudeikis cannot land a hot 20-year-old girl. Yeah. Whereas 
Christina Applegate is sort of exploring this flirtation with a a college age baseball player, so presumably somewhere around the same age. But there, it's treated as gross that she would be with a younger man. Is it? I, I I didn't think it was actually. In the scene when she says, "This is this can't be a thing. We can't do this anymore. This has to be this has to be a one time deal." He's like, "Well, obviously, of course. Like you're so old." Ugh. Yeah, well, but I thought that was kind of the the point of that turn was that we, the audience, were thinking like, you know, she's going to have to break this kid's heart because he's thinking it can, you know, because everybody's thinking, oh, this could work. And then she's going to have to tell him, look, I'm married and I got to go back to my married life and blah, 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 blah. And then he has the issue with her being old. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't it didn't, you know, because sometimes you can tell when. When a filmmaker is presenting a perspective in order to lampoon it. Yeah. And it didn't really feel like that was what was going on here to me. Well, that's what I got out of it. But again, you know, it's like when Lee makes the anal joke. It's very difficult to tell at times in this movie when it's an actual character joke or when it's the filmmakers being like, ba-boomba, right? I mean, it, it makes it it makes it difficult to tell which one's real and, and which one's Memorex. Yeah. That's the other thing. Like, I get that the entire kind of farcical premise of this entire thing is they're really fucking bad at picking up chicks. I mean, that's really what this is about. It has, like, little or nothing to do with their marriage. It's all about, like, they're just horrible at picking up chicks. But I'm like, does Providence not have a single bar? You know, it's not until Coakley comes along that they get the idea to go to a club. No, I guess they right. try it once more and they aren't allowed in. But it's like, you know, there are lots of bars and clubs that don't have bouncers. My other thought is it's like every woman I know has a story about in her past when she was 20 and dating a 40-year-old, you know? And so it's like, is it really that difficult? Like, I, I mean, it just, I just don't get, like, if they've really fantasized about this so much, why are they so inept at it? It's it's really like painful to watch at times because it's like I I just don't believe that they are this stupid, you know? Owen Wilson knows that it's not something he can do. For his character, what would have made more sense is like, honey, can we please for the love of God beg or pay your parents to take the kids for a week? We'll go get a hotel room, we'll get some moxie. <laughs> we'll just fuck like bunnies. Cuz we talk about drugs on this podcast. <laughs> I don't even know what Moxley is, so. <laughs> uh, I'm still I'm still Googling the chronic from earlier. Uh, <laughs> do we want to say anything more about the friends? Like the token black guy? I think that's interesting how, you know, like um, um, uh, tampon commercials and stuff have you believe that all women hang out in a group with two white women, a black woman, and an Asian woman. And <laughs> it seems like kind of... In general, guys hang out with mostly white American guys, and then there's usually, like, one foreigner of some sort and a black dude. Yeah, and that's exactly what we had here. We, we, had, we had our protagonist, Owen Wilson. We had the douchey, misogynistic best friend. We had the fat guy. We had the guy with an accent. And we had the token black guy. Like, that rounded out their quint. Wilfred, if you could change one thing about this movie to make it much, much better, what would it be? I guess what I would do is I would have one of those couples actually decide that sexual non-monogamy, at least for them, is a good way to go. I think that maybe Jason Sudeikis and Christina Applegate would realize, hey, our relationship is perfect except for the fact that we don't really want to have sex with each other. So let's keep our relationship and just have sex with other people occasionally. That works. That works. Yeah. That seems like a like an interesting and not and and it still it wouldn't ruin the kind of main romantic thrust of the movie, right? So uh, yeah, uh, so I, I think you could probably get away with that. I think I would replace Coakley with a bear. <laughs> have have the character written exactly the same and everybody react to him exactly the same, but it is just a live trained bear with the same hat and chains and stuff. Yeah, yeah. And mm. and the audience wouldn't be able to understand him, but the characters would. You know, he would just be like, <laughs> would, it, would, it 
Would he get subtitles or would we just have context clues? Yeah, you might have to monkey around with some of the lines. I I don't know. Maybe maybe subtitles would be the way to go. So that way you could just keep all the lines exactly the same. But yeah, I think as much as I enjoyed that actor, I think um, I think that's the way I would go. Replace Coakley with a live bear. What about if instead of only being a bartender with only one line, Bo Burnham played every character? Okay. I mean, I guess that sums it up. I mean, it, it's just it's just a horrible movie. I think it would be interesting to do something that really does actually flirt more with the idea of non-monogamy and see how the mainstream handles that. I loved Roger Ebert's review of, I think it was Friends with Benefits, or maybe it was No Strings Attached. Those both came out at about the same time, looked like the exact same goddamn movie. And his review was like, this film pauses the question, can two people who are physically attracted to each other but don't necessarily want a relationship have nothing but a physical relationship? The answer is obviously yes, but anyway... <laughs> <laughs> I was like, I love you, Roger Ebert. <laughs> but, you know, I think it would be interesting to see one of those types of movies that's made for the mainstream where you know that obviously it's going to end with them being together in a heteromonogamous way and see how they handle that. This really was just all about how can we wedge in the next fart joke or whatever, you know? Right. I mean, if we wanted that, we could have watched Van Wilder for fuck's sake. <laughs> For now, this is Michael T. Bradley. And J. Wilfred Neville. And of course, be sure to visit iceonmars.net. View us on SoundCloud and iTunes. And please, please, please rate, review, follow any of those things that you kids these days are doing with the mollies and the chronics and the moxies <laughs> and the trolling and the... I don't I don't even know. Um, yeah. Just, uh, just uh, I don't know where that was going. Do drugs and listen to us? No, don't do drugs. Don't do illegal drugs. Come to Portland. In, in about a month, it's all, uh, it's not all legal here. Pot's going to be legal. I went off on <laughs> Wait, a real tangent legal? there. I'm going I'm to come there and get some heroin. <laughs> yeah, you're going to ride that horse up here in Portland. And some, no, and some Cialis. I'm going to need some Cialis. <laughs> that's, I guess that's, like you, you probably need a prescription though. However, if symptoms occur for more than three hours at a time, that's called priapism and talk to your doctor. Have a good night. <laughs> Bye, everybody. You have been listening to Ice on Mars. <laughs>